I didn't start with a get rich quick idea. I mean, we got excited about going out and making some cash. That's all we did. We saw an opportunity to make some cash. We got excited about making that money and grew the business slowly. And over 10 years, our entire lives changed. I haven't told my story in a while, so I'm gonna tell it to you right now. I was born in Southern Indiana to, um, my mom was an RN, a school nurse, and my dad was a construction manager for a, a local real estate developer. Um, we were middle class and I went to a public school and I didn't grow up in the country club era. I didn't grow up with neighbors and friends that were multimillionaires, but my dad understood business. And when I was in sixth grade, he 13 years old. Yeah. Sixth grade. Well, how old was I in when I was 13? maybe fifth grade or fourth grade. He, uh, his boss called him into his office and said, Tim, um, the guy who mows all the lawns for our commercial properties in town here um, has had a health problem. He had a heart attack. He's fine, but he can't mow the grass anymore. We gotta, we gotta find a company that can do this. Can you, you know, look around town and see if you can find somebody who can mow these lawns. And my dad, the excitable uh, optimist that he is, he said, oh, my son, Nick, can do this work. You know, he'll get a lawnmower and I'm going to teach him how to do it. He'll run his own business. But uh, I was 13. So um, he took me to town. And, and we're not talking about a small job. We're talking about probably 20 hours a week of mowing. Um, seven commercial properties, three multifamilies, and the rest shopping centers. And um, this was also 15 minutes away from my childhood house. So my dad put me on, set me down at the kitchen table, taught me how business was meant to work and told me that he would lease my, uh, the family mower to me, lease the family mower to me for $20 a week. And uh, he would buy me a trailer and put me on a, a little lawnmower trailer to, to haul behind a truck and put me on payment plans for that. And then he'd also lease the truck to me for $20, $20 a week. And I didn't have my license, so I also had to pay my mom uh, $10 an hour to drive me to town. This was in 2003 or 2002. Um, this all went down and get to town. It's July. It's 98 degrees in Southern Indiana. And I started mowing. I got in the first shopping center. I started mowing and there was so much trash in the grass. I didn't pick up the trash in advance. I had no idea what I was doing. And I was just making clouds of trash. And my dad pulled me off the mower and said, you can't do that. You know, we got to pick up the trash. And at this point, the trash was instead of about 75 pieces of trash, we're talking about, you know, fast food bags, um, cups, styrofoam cups. Um, instead of about 75 pieces of trash at this point, there were 75,000 pieces of trash because I had mowed it up and shoot it up. And I had to go through and pick it all up. It was hot, sweaty. I was 13 years old. And I, I just cried and told my dad that I, I quit. I'm not doing this. This is ridiculous. It's hell. Why Why am I out here doing this? Um, he pulled me in the truck. He put an ice towel on my neck and said, you know, you're not allowed to quit. Like, we're going to find a way to make this easier, but I'm not going to let you quit. So he took me over. We got some ice cream. We calmed down. I, I went back out. I finished that first job. And then when we got home, I got to bill for that day's work. And I did some pretty basic math and realized I was making about 35 to $40 an hour as a 13 year old mowing grass after paying my mom to sit in the truck and after leasing these cars or equipment. Um, I got tired of paying my mom about six months later. So I went to the high school uh, hallway at school and I put flyers in every locker that said, you know, work with me for $15 an hour, show up at my house and drive to town, must have a driver's license and the ability to run a weed eater. Um, a week later, I hired a kid to show up at my house, drive the truck for me. I was going to pay him $15 an hour, but he was going to help me. My mom just sat in the truck. That was frustrating for me. He was going to help me. Um, and I very quickly got a crash course in business, how to solve problems, how to think about problems, what to do when you know your mower breaks down and or it's raining or you got something that you want to do, and but you got work to do. Fast forward to 2008 when I went off to college, I had about 40 grand saved up. It was awesome. Um, went to college, no idea what I want to do. I ran track at Cornell University, um, ended up having a pretty good track career there. And junior year during finals week, 
I posted my apartment on Craigslist and posting it on Craigslist, wanting somebody to come and rent it from me over the summer because I was going to be gone. Um, instead of somebody renting it over the summer for me, from me, they wanted to store some stuff in my apartment. This mom was frustrated with this local, uh, this kid's mom, who was a, also a student at Cornell, was frustrated with the local company and said, Nick, I don't want to lease your apartment, but I'll give you 150 bucks if you come and pick up my son's stuff and store it in his apartment all year. Well, I learned a lot from that job because I agreed and went to pick it up and it was twice as much as she said. I filled up half my room and then I had realized, damn, now I can't lease this. I might as well try to get more customers the same way. So I went around town with some flyers, put, you know, pick up and delivery student storage on, on these flyers and the phone started ringing and I started driving around picking up people's stuff. And before I knew it, my room was full. Then my buddy who was from California, he was about to leave town. Um, he had no subletter over the summer. His room was full too. Too. I filled his room up with stuff and gave him a cut of the money. Same with the other two rooms in the apartment. And then I was out of space. So I went to College Town where my par business partner now, uh, Dan, my business partner who owns uh, half of everything that we do in self-storage business, he uh, had a big, big uh, building and I was moving into it the next year. Had a full basement. They had seven rooms. It was a big house that they leased. It was, called, it was a track house on State Street in Ithaca. Fast forward to a week later, we had filled that basement full of stuff. He had a big Buick, I had a big Cadillac car. We were driving around picking up stuff. And a week later, we had $3,000 cash and had stored all this stuff in the basement and we were off. Shook hands, 50-50 business partners and started Storage Squad Student Storage. Um, the next year, it was our senior year. We knew that we were gonna have some serious opportunity costs to go off and do this small business. So we, got serious about it. We knew that we just, we couldn't do only Ithaca at Cornell. We had to set a goal for a certain amount of customers. Our goal was 250 customers and we needed to launch at a couple more locations. So we chose Indiana University in Bloomington. We chose University of Illinois in Champaign and we chose Iowa in Iowa City. Uh, we had friends at those locations. Dan had a first cousin at Illinois. I had a good friend at Indiana. Dan's uh, best friend from college or from high school was at, at Iowa. We did revenue sharing plans with them. We used student loan money to buy three vans, one for Ithaca or four vans actually, one for Ithaca, um, one for each of those locations. We went around on Craigslist and bought them for about $1,500 a pop, about 10 year old or 10 to 15 year old um, Econoline, Ford Econoline vans. Uh, we got 256 customers our senior year. It was stressful. I was trying to graduate. We were at college or at the um, Ivy League championships and I was answering customer service calls between events of the decathlon that I was doing my senior year. Um, graduation morning before we graduated, I went and picked up stuff um, from people with my car. Um, we were grinding. Decided to go full time, went to that business. We opened up a couple more locations the next year. It was Penn State, um, uh, Syracuse, a couple more locations. The business grew. We went um, next thing we knew, we did $250,000 of revenue the next year. The year after that, we went to Boston. Um, I bought, We, me and Dan were living in Chicago in a, in a small house. Um, we bought a box truck on the south side of Chicago for $2,200. Went to a really, really rough neighborhood to get it. Looking back, I never should have done that. Um, but we basically bought that van and or bought that truck and I went out to Boston to launch a new branch there. Filled it up with box trucks and supplies my uh, girlfriend at the time now wife was living in boston um and that's where the, all the colleges were went out there to start the business there dan went to penn state a couple more locations to, to launch and convinced a friend of ours in philadelphia to open a branch there and washington dc and the business was really growing at this point five hundred fifty thousand dollars of revenue that year the next year 1.2 million dollars of revenue the next year 1.7 and it was on um, it was a really really hard business we had six full-time employees at our peak, but we had 180 part-time employees who did the pickups and the deliveries on the college campuses. Um, we were renting box trucks. We had to lease warehouse space. And at our peak, we were at 25 colleges and in like 13 or 14 markets in 12 states, meaning we had to lease 14 different warehouses part-time for the summer to store the stuff. We had to get the boxes delivered. We had to deliver boxes and tape to all the customers leading up to finals week while we were recruiting and hiring all the employees to drive the trucks and deliver the stuff and pick up the stuff. So when the college kids went home for the summer, our Super Bowl would happen. That's when we were running around picking up as much stuff as possible, trying to store it and deliver it. 
Um, we did that business for several years and it was sort of profitable. We're talking three to $500,000 a year of profit between me and Dan. And we put that money away, saved it. And in 2015, we decided that we were going to build. This was 2011 that we started the company. By 2015, we had a little bit of money aside, maybe three to $500,000. And we decided that we were going to get in the real estate game and build self-storage as a kind of a future endeavor. Because we knew that this service business was not that scalable. It was really hard, really stressful. Um, we had horror stories of operating this business where we were sleeping in warehouses, go 20, um, 20 days straight with three to four hours a night sleep. We were traveling around. Um, driving box trucks, working our, our butts off and dealing with problem after problem after problem. You know, people crashing vans, um, crazy customer service complaints, uh, warehouses that flooded, all these really problematic things about this business that made it so stressful. Well, so 2015, we decided to build a self-storage facility. We did a, a market analysis on all the markets we were in and decided that Ithaca, New York was our prime location to build a self-storage facility. Um, bought a piece of property or got a piece of property under contract for $250,000, um, got to work on planning and permitting to build this property. It took a year and a half to get it started. Um, by 2016, July of 2016, we had started the earthwork. We were going to build a 38,000 rentable square foot climate controlled self-storage facility. Um, and we were going to spend $1.9 million. Um, I didn't know anything about real estate private equity. I didn't know anything about real estate at all. My first job was to go find bankers to loan us this money. We needed to borrow 1.3 to 1.4 million, 75% LTV loan on this first deal. Um, went around and talked to 20 bankers in the area and we got turned down, but all but one. I showed up with a ton of underwriting materials that were looking back, uh, <laughs> not very good. None of this was very good, but we did a big market study. We showed up with a binder, showed up with a packet. I was super organized. I showed up in a suit. I pitched all these bankers. And one of them, I, I remember the one that actually did the loan with us, Michelle Turek with Tompkins Trust Company. She said, this is the, probably the most organized packet we've ever seen for a loan. And this was a compliment for me, considering I was 25 years old and had no idea what commercial real estate was. But since we were in, that, in the storage business, we kind of convinced them to give us the loan. And we had a little bit of cash on our balance sheet but we still needed to raise about $500,000. That also took me a year and a half of traveling around to all the family friends I knew, all my dad's friends, anybody that I could meet online, anybody through Cornell that I went to college with. We even raised at the very last second, the broker who sold us the, the ground, that $250,000 piece of ground. Um, he saw us and he was working with me in the planning department, watching me work of trying to get this loan approved. and. I guess he was impressed with us, but he ended up investing the last big chunk over $100,000 in the deal to get us fully funded and off. Um, we wore out every single opportunity to raise money that we possibly could. And our structure was all wonky. We, we literally had no idea what we were doing. Um, the building ended up going way over budget. The $1.9 million budget turned into a $2.4 million budget. And we were already broken ground. We were already pot committed. We could not stop. So we had to go out and ask those same investors for 20% more money. It was brutal, but they all ponied up. And we finally got the thing open for business in May of 2017. That's six years ago now. Then it started going well. We started leasing a ton of units, started making money. We're three years in, or two years in, it's, it's 2019. And the property's cash flowing well already. We go back to the bank and we say, hey, um, all this time we're running our student storage business on the side. I'm very involved as well. We're running it on the side. I'd moved to Athens, Georgia in 2018. Um, we go back to the bank and say, Hey, this is worth more money. Let's get it refinanced and pull some cash out. Got it refinanced. It was worth $5.25 million. So we ended up putting about $4 million of debt on the property and boom, got a $2 million check at closing. We returned the $500,000 of the investor money, had a lot of money left over ourselves and our eyes lit up. And we knew right then that our plan was to do more self-storage and real estate. So we bought a couple more small properties that year and just kept growing. In 2020, when COVID hit, um, our student storage business fell apart because in March, instead of in May, in March, all the students got sent home. We were scraping around, working to get as much business as we could. Um, we put our big boy pants on and sold and went to some prop, went to some schools and did full service packing, even though we weren't really that qualified. And we just grind, grinded and grinded and grinded, did what we had to do to get as much business as possible. It ended up being our best year ever. 
We ended up clearing over a million dollars um, and just had a really, really good year from an income perspective in 2020. Since the business had that good year, we were able to actually sell the, the whole company. We sold the whole company for seven figures. It was 1.75 million. And we had no debt on the business. We bonused out a couple of our key employees really well and moved right along. That was more fuel, more capital for us in our pocket so we could go buy and build more storage. Bought a three pack of storage facilities at auction for $620,000 in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, it was a mess. They only had about five or 6% of the, the facility leased, but all the units were full. We had to go through and cut, cut locks, get all the, the units cleared. And fast forward to today, we bought that property in 2019. Fast forward to today, it's worth 2.3 million. We just did a big cash out refinance on it. It's awesome. Um, bought another small property across the street from our first one in Ithaca, combined them together, did another refinance just six months ago in Ithaca at a, at an $8.3 million valuation. Another huge win for us and our investors up at that very first property. Um, and the rest is history. I got on Twitter and started tweeting right after COVID or right around COVID time. And I started meeting investors and the last piece of the puzzle was solved because me, I didn't know anybody who had money. I had no idea what real estate private equity was, but I, got, I gave myself a crash course in it. We set up a good structure. I had some mentors like Chris Powers and Moses Kagan. And uh, then all of a sudden, the last piece of the puzzle, the capital was solved and we could go out and buy a lot of storage. 2021, we bought $50 million worth of self-storage. Our, our company grew from six employees to, to over 50 now. And um, here we are today. We own 62 self-storage facilities. Um, we've raised over $30 million of investor capital it's probably closer to 50 now. We have 50 employees and um, all the so all the properties are doing really well. And here we are. So that's my story. And it's been a heck of a ride. And I think the one big takeaway, if you could, you know, take one thing away from this, it's that I didn't, I didn't start with a, a new sexy idea. I didn't start with uh, a get rich quick idea. I mean, we got excited about going out and making some cash. That's all we did. We saw an opportunity to make some cash. We got excited about making that money and grew the business slowly. And over 10 years, our entire lives changed from 2011 to 2021. Our entire lives changed. So business is really about momentum and I'm good at what I do now. I'm good at running this company. I'm good at making these decisions now because I got eight years of practice in the trenches running a really, really hard business running a business with box trucks and truck rentals and part-time employees that didn't care and logistics in major cities and trying to go around and rent a warehouse space in towns and cities where there was a, a, a increasing, uh, you know, not enough industrial real estate in these towns. And we had to go and lease it part-time. We only wanted to pay three months. Nobody cared about listening to us. And we just solved a lot of problems and dealt with a lot of adversity and struggle and went through some things that were very, very stressful. And stress is relative. If you've never really dealt with real problems, the smallest things can seem really stressful. If you are used to it and you understand that it's all gonna be fine and you understand that all you can do is your best and you understand that business is inherently risky and you just work through it over time to get better and better and better and better, um, that's how, that's how great things can happen. And you can build a skill set that's absolutely incredible. So that first business, it was really risky. Um, it was not that profitable, especially for the amount of work we did. And it was insanely hard and insanely stressful. But what we learned in that business, we can work circles around people now in the real estate private equity world. It's the same, business is the same. It's hiring people, it's managing people, and it's making decisions. And we got really good at that stuff early on. Um, and that's my story. So hope you enjoyed Juniper Square, the sponsor of this show, recently conducted some research to help you understand what real estate investment managers are doing to build stronger relationships with their investors and earn more referrals to new investors. Their new special report includes data on topics such as what factors are the most important for building investment relationships today, how technology is being used to provide a competitive edge, and the one technology integration that is driving more repeat investors and more referrals. To download this for free, visit junipersquareresearch.com. Again, to get this report for free, visit junipersquareresearch.com.
Before you go, we have a new sponsor of the show, recostseg.com. And if you bought a piece of real estate, you need to get a cost segregation study done. It's what allows you to get all that sweet, sweet bonus depreciation. And it's how real estate investors like me and many others pay almost nothing in taxes on an annual basis. You can cost seg a single family rental, a short term rental, or a large commercial property. Um, recostseg.com is affordable and aggressive and super fast to turn them around. They've done 10 plus cost segs for me this year. They're going to do many more for me. Um, visit recostseg.com to learn more.